when we got the diagnosis of SLD, specific learning disability from the school, I didn't know what that was. I felt like at that IEP meeting, they were hiding something from me. I kept saying, how are we going to teach her how to read? And it was all this mumbo jumbo teacher talk. I didn't understand anything. Towards the end of that meeting, the psychologist at the time, who was a member of the IEP team said, well, when a child has dyslexia, we do. And I said, she has dyslexia? And she immediately said, no, no, I didn't say that. I said, yes, you did. She has dyslexia? And everybody on the team looked like they saw a ghost. And I said, well, how do we find out if she has dyslexia? Uh, uh, um, well, uh, uh, it was weird. Nobody wanted to tell me how. And so in my mind, I started thinking, well, I've got to get her evaluated not understanding that the evaluation that the school did was sufficient, right? It identified characteristics of dyslexia, but they just didn't tell me that. Hello, and welcome to the Black and Dyslexic Podcast with Winifred A. Winston and LaDerek Horn, the show that unapologetically focuses on helping Black and underrepresented minorities navigate the special education process. We want to help raise awareness in the Black and Brown community, remove the stigma about learning disabilities, and provide you access to professionals in the space of dyslexia and special education that you need to hear from. Today, we are going to have a very special episode. This is sort of our nod to the holiday season, and I hope everyone is enjoying the holiday season. It's in full swing. We're going to have an episode today where we're going to hear from the host, the founder of the Black and Dyslexic podcast, Ms. Winifred A. Winston. Winifred, how are you? This is weird. I'm fine, but this is different. We're going to chat a little. This gives us an opportunity. I, I know in every episode that the audience has got an opportunity to hear from you and to learn from you, but I thought this would be a, a great little gift that we could give to our audience to hear a little bit more about your story and your steps into advocacy and, and uh, sort of creating this wonderful podcast space that we're all able to enjoy and learn from. So Winifred, I just want to start out by, by saying, just or asking very directly, when did this journey in the advocacy start for you? Yeah, this is a little weird. Yes, <laughs> be it in the, in the seat, but it, it's necessary because what I realize is that a lot of our listeners are very new to me, to my voice, to your voice, to us, right? And they got an opportunity to hear from you at the onset yes. of the podcast. So this is pretty cool. We actually started in this advocacy journey in 2017. My daughter was initially in a private school. We had her in a small private Christian school. And um, after coming from a, I want to call it a learning center. She was in a home daycare center, uh, progress-based learning center, which is now uh, closed. But that's a great story. (laughs) But she was there and they taught her. And it was very much around learning. And I remember the owner saying, yes, when Logan learns, she needs to be clapping, jumping up, moving. I remember her telling me that. And then we left the small, very family-oriented daycare center for a small private Christian school. And I remember Logan was in kindergarten. She went there for pre-K and K. And it was five children in class, three kindergarten, and two first graders. And we had to move her from the reading group. It's only Mm -hmm. three girls in the reading group. But she said when Logan, when it was her time to read, she was shaking. She was so nervous. And the teacher was like, mom, I know you're hard on her. You've got to ease up you know, um, she's going to get it. And I'm thinking it's me, right? I'm thinking it's me. I'm too tough on her. And we pulled her from the reading group, but get this. She graduated kindergarten valedictorian. How about that? I was like, okay, that's weird. Cause I am in all honesty and transparency, equating intelligence with reading, Mm. right? Uh, There, there's a bit of that. Although I'm like, oh, my baby's smart. She has a vast vocabulary at the You know, at three, she's saying defecate and using it correctly, you know, and you tell her a word and you tell her what it means and how to use it. And she holds on to it and verbally she could out talk anybody. Right. Right. But in kindergarten, that's when I noticed that she wasn't she wasn't learning to read. And um, at the private school, they had to learn Bible scriptures every week. We had to learn scripture. So that meant and I say we because I learned it because. She had to learn it and we're practicing and we, she would learn it for the week and she would take the test and she would get a hundred. And then next week I would try to go over that previous one and the current one. And it was like, she never learned. 
the first one. Now I know I'm the same way. Those scriptures were gone after she took the test and after she learned it, um, it was gone. And now I know, you know, like, hmm, that was something there. And then when we went into, for first grade, when we went into public school, we got into a charter school um, that was project-based arts integration. I could not have picked a better school for her and her learning style without, at this point, I did not know she was dyslexic. Um, I told the school, you know, we're coming from a small private school. I'm terrified of the large class sizes in public school. Um, we were at a charter school, so they were about 24, 25 maybe. And at this particular charter school, kids in uh, K through, I want to say third grade, there were two adults in the classroom. There was a teacher and then an assistant. You didn't have that in your traditional public schools. Um, and so I'm like, okay, this is going to work out. I'm telling them her handwriting is going to be sloppy because she learned cursive. She, she's never written in print, right? This is what I'm telling them. I'm concerned about her reading. Okay. I'm concerned uh, about her reading and not really retaining sight words. And I told them that I told them that after the first progress report, you know, I'm still having these concerns. So they started with, now that I know it's um, response to intervention, RTI, the principal at the time was a first year principal, but she had been the reading specialist prior to this being her first year. So she worked with Logan one-on-one, yeah. the principal did. And um, they sent home instructional material on how we could help at home. And it was all around whole liter literacy, um, looking at the picture. And, and, you know, and so I'm like, okay, I'm trying to help her. And towards the end of first grade, they're like, oh, we saw progress. You know, they told me things like, we're going to let her know in advance that we're going to call on her when they're on the carpet. You know, we, we see some progress, but I wasn't satisfied because I couldn't really see any progress at home when I try to read books to her and say, okay, you read a page. I uh, forgot what the books are called, but they're books that have, um, they're like mommy and me. Mommy read one page, the child reads another page, and the text is bigger for the kids. The, you know, it's really designed for mommy and me to read along. We were doing all of that. So I didn't just, I didn't see enough progress. So I said I wanted to get her evaluated. I was about and to say, this, this, she, she didn't have a diagnosis at this point. Nope, nope. Okay. This was the so, end of first grade. So at this point, she's like a struggling reader. Yep. Um, and and you get a sense that there's something going on. So you decide, go ahead and do evaluation. Yep. This is the end of first grade. And I'll also preference it with one of the children from daycare. Her friend Maddie is one day older than her. And so Maddie is reading, but I'm thinking in my head, well, I'm not going to compare my child to other children, but I'm like, gosh, Maddie's one day older, right? They had the same foundation at the daycare. And then um, I have a nephew who was born. He's the same age, but his birthday's in May and Logan's birthday's February. So I'm like, well, developmentally, she's a little older. She should be ahead. Mm -mm. Kayan is reading. Kayan wrote her a letter in the mail. She didn't even want to try to read it. She was like, no, I don't want to look at it. Mommy, you read it. You know, and so I'm like, okay, okay, they're doing that. And she's not doing this, right? So that was like in the back of my mind. So at the end of first grade, I said, yes, I want to get her evaluated. And I could tell they were like being very gentle with me right? Like if I was going to say, no, I don't want her evaluated. Don't do that. But I was like, yes, that's what I've been waiting for. Like, yeah, let's do that because I'd rather know what's going on than not. Because I felt like without even knowing, I felt like we're just trying things, but we don't really know what's going on. And what, what for, can I, can I just jump in here? Because you and I, we were having a conversation earlier about how parents oftentimes when they're starting to see that child struggle, there's a sometimes a bias to just say, let's just wait and see, right? Let's, let's see if they can grow out of it, you know, or they're looking at areas where, you know, like, yeah, she was the valedictorian of, you know, at a few, just a few years earlier, maybe, maybe everything would be all right. What made you want to, to lean into getting the evaluation done? I think because of my professional experience, I've worked in higher education and career services, and I was an adjunct professor. And I was an adjunct professor specifically at a school here in Baltimore called Sojourner Douglas College with adult learners. And I knew my students, my adult students were struggling, right? I didn't know what it was, but I'm thinking, what, how do you like this? We're writing resumes and cover letters and I'm having you do um, bios for LinkedIn, but, but this isn't looking good. 
And then I dropped down and started teaching at the high school level. Mm. And that was very eye-opening for me because I was at a traditional high school. Then I was at an alternative high school. And um, I remember we did some assessments. I want to say it was iReady. And we had three children, two middle school reading level and one high school reading level out of 100 kids. And my students wanted to learn. My students struggled with comprehension, with reading. You know, I had one student tell me, well, you know, my father, he was like this. I'm gonna just be just like him. I remember that thinking, wow, like as their teacher, some of them, I didn't know how to help them, right? We're, we're in high school. I remember I had one, one girl, I never forget her. She was a senior. She was about to graduate. She was reading on a third grade level. Now I know I probably wasn't supposed to do this, but just like, remember we interviewed Kareem Weaver. It's like, you do what you need to do in that classroom for your, for your students. Right. I sent her to the special educator for reading intervention during my class because I taught career research and development and we were doing word problems and I was teaching about overtime pay, how to calculate overtime pay. And I was giving a word problem. If Lederick worked so many hours straight time and then he worked so many hours overtime, what, you know, how much did he earn and things like that? And she was just struggling. She was lost. And all I kept saying is, this is going to be the cashier who can't count back change. Mm. Right. And I thought, oh my gosh, nobody recognized this. This child can't read. And so I sent her during my class time to a special educator to read with her because that special educator uh, didn't have a period that at that time. And I said, look, this is the only thing I can come up with to help her. Now she will copy everything I write on the board. She will copy all the notes, right? But she just didn't know how to read. And so I think having that experience and knowing that these children look like me, they wanted to learn. And at this point, they're in high school about to go out into the world and weren't prepared. Yeah. And so think- you're so you're able to see them as adults and young adults, like your daughter is them so many years yes. you know, y- younger. And if, and if you don't step in now, yep, this is what their life is going to look like further down the line. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And so I was very open to let's, let's find out because I felt like we would be doing things and not really addressing what's going on because initially her school was like, well, we'll like when they told me we're going to call, let her know that we're going to call on her on the carpet. I kept saying, well, what the hell is that going to do? If she doesn't know how to read, like, okay, you're going to give her a heads up. (laughs) Like, I just, now I know that that's an accommodation, right? But at that moment, I'm like, okay, you're going to call on her, let her know. Because therein lies, she wasn't um, focusing, right? Because that that was the ADHD, but I didn't know that either. And then there's the fear element. That was was something that they did for me, because I I would be so afraid of having to read. You couldn't even listen to anybody else reading. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, I remember that the assessments went into the summer because they evaluated her and came back and wanted to do an OT, occupational therapy, an OT assessment, right? So the occupational therapist wanted to evaluate her because therein lies there was some dysgraphia or dyspraxia, we're still up in the air about that. And that is written expression. That is when a child has trouble writing. Yeah. So her penmanship wasn't sloppy because she went from print to cursive. I did not know this. Her cursive was beautiful. I used to take pictures of it and post it online. She really wrote beautiful. And I kept telling her in public school, continue to write like that, Logan. She was like, well, no, mommy, nobody else is. Nobody mm-hmm. else is. So she was writing in print. And print is where we saw her going sideways up the page. And it was her spacing was off. Right. So she would write a sentence and all the words would be jumbled together. She's not spacing appropriately. And so that was the dysgraphia or dyspraxia. I'm using those interchangeably because I'm still on the fence. Her report says dysgraphia, also known as dyspraxia, which those are two different things. So therein lies the psychologist didn't know what she was doing. But Mm. that's that's, you know, but um, but I understood now, like, wow, that's why her handwriting, that's why she struggles to write. That's why um, writing is very laborious for her. It takes her a long time. You know, her hand is tired. And that assessment was done over the summer. So we started second grade with um, an IEP. Wow. Okay. Yeah. How's she doing now? Oh, oh, she's in sixth grade. We left public school during second grade. So second grade starts in what? School year starts in August, September. By October, I had a, a, a tutor. By October, I had an OG tutor, Orton Gillingham tutor, 
by January of that next year, February, she's doing Linda Mubell tutoring 10 hours a week. By March, I'm going to see an attorney. He's telling me to stop the tutoring. I leave his office crying. I'm like, my baby is her confidence, her confidence. She was reading words. She, she knew how to attack them. Um, I always noticed that she would sound out the front of the word, the beginning, and then the end, but couldn't put it together. Now she's putting words together. And the attorney is like, stop the tutoring. I didn't understand. I didn't understand the process. Well, who's going to take credit for that? The school, right? You, you can't say that we know that it was the Linda Mubell because within two weeks of my daughter enrolled in the program, the assistant teacher from her school called me, you know, wanting to know what was I doing? What program was Logan in? Because she sees her using the strategies, right? So I said in my head, Linda Mubell was able to do in two weeks more than what the school could do in four months, right? And so by this time, I'm starting to notice that she is a little eclectic. I, I'm, I'm going to say that because now she's in public school with more children, yeah. right? And, and I'm able to see beyond just the, the, the little community of children that we've always been around, right? So for example, she was punched in the face when she was in uh, first grade or okay. second grade. And her response was, because another little kid told the kid to hit her. And her response was, I can't believe a child told another child to hit a child and that child listened. <laughs> <laughs> and then she started quoting the mission of the school. Like mm. the mission is to be kind and da 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 da. And I'm thinking, <laughs> okay, that's your response. Right. Right. So kids are going to pick on you. You, kids, I would have been that little kid that hit her too. Like, what? What, what is that response, right? And then she went up to the child's mother when, the, when the, the, the child's mother came and your child hit me. She punched me in the face. That's against the rules. Mm. So I'm just like, oh, that's different. That's not a normal response for, for a child, right? Mm. And I'm like, okay. You know, she's, I call it eclectic. I don't know, but it was just, I'm noticing because previously I would just say she had an old soul. She's raised in the house with two adults. We don't talk baby talk to her. We have regular conversations with her. You know, she has an older sister who's like 13 years older than her, you know, but now I'm like, oh, okay. I'm just noticing and putting things together. And now I'm seeing her in a space with other, with more children, with different children, right? Other than our family, right? Because when you're family, you just, oh, that's just, that's just Logan. Right. That's just how she is. But now I'm, I'm looking at her in, in this space with other children. And I'm like, OK, my baby thinks differently. Yeah. But I didn't really I never said my baby thinks differently. I just knew she operated differently and thought things through different than other children her age, because now I've got way more children. That's her age to kind of say, oh, OK, there's something going on here. So she's doing Linda Mubell two hours every day after school, Monday through Friday, from January to about May, she was tired. Yeah. There was no after school activities. We didn't have the time nor the money. We were paying someone to pick her up from school and take her to tutoring. And then we would pick her up from tutoring. And um, I thought, well, dang, we're doing all this, paying all this money. Let's just put her in a private dyslexia school. And so then we started um, trying to find a school for her, but I want to back up and add this. When we got the diagnosis of SLD, specific learning disability from the school, I didn't know what that was. I felt like at that IEP meeting, they were hiding something from me. I kept saying, how are we going to teach her how to read? How are we going to teach her how to read? And it was all this mumbo jumbo teacher talk. I didn't understand anything. Towards the end of that meeting, the psychologist at the time, who was a member of the IEP team said, well, when a child has dyslexia, we do. And I said, she has dyslexia? And the, she immediately said, no, no, I didn't say that. I said, yes, you did. She has dyslexia? And everybody on the team looked like they saw a ghost. Wow. And, and I said, well, how do we find out if she has dyslexia? Uh, uh, um, well, uh, uh, it was weird. Nobody wanted to tell me how. And so in my mind, I started thinking, well, I've got to get her evaluated, not understanding that the evaluation that the school did was sufficient, right? Mm -hmm. It identified characteristics of dyslexia, but they just didn't tell me that. And why do you think that was? 
Oh, they don't say it in, in our district in Baltimore City Public Schools at the time. They weren't identifying dyslexia. They weren't saying dyslexia. The IEP would have specific learning disability and that parent would never know that their child had dyslexia, right? Because no one told them. And as a parent, you go into this, you don't know that under IDEA, there are 13 codes and SLD is the code that dyslexia would fall under. Dyslexia, dysgraphia, dyscalculia, a nonverbal learning disorder, any kind of a speech would, not any kind of speech, I don't want to say incorrect information, but dyslexia, dyscalculia, dysgraphia, and nonverbal learning disability would fall under SLD, right. right? I did not know that. And so I was on a mission then to find out if she had dyslexia. And I remember crying in my car after that IEP meeting because I thought, I don't know what's going on with my baby. They're not telling me. And I literally felt like they were hiding something from me because when I said, oh, she has dyslexia and they all said, no, that's not what I said. I'm like, what is going on? I called my cousin who's an attorney and she did some special education law. She's very calm talking to me. She's the one who told me about Linda Mubell. I called her pediatrician in tears, Dr. Betty. Dr. Betty says, call this psychologist, Janice Lepore, and talk to her. Just calm down, mom, calm down. I called the principal of her school because at this point, I think that meeting was the determination meeting, but we had not put any interventions or, or services or anything in place. So I was just ahead. Like, how are we going to help her? And I'm crying to the principal because Linda Mubell was so expensive, right? And she's like, that's a learning center. Give us an opportunity. Give us a chance. And so when I called Janice Lepore, I talked to her for 45 minutes. She's a psychologist. Again, very calm. Well, mom, what do you want to know? I want to know if she has dyslexia. They won't say it. And she says, well, based on everything that you're telling me, you know, I don't have the report in front of me. Let's say she does. Let's go ahead and say she does. You know, she's telling me you don't want to over evaluate, over assess her. Let's give the school time. She said, in the meantime, mom, you need to start educating yourself. She told me, I want you to go to visit dis private dyslexia schools and see what they're doing. Mm. I said, there are private dyslexia schools? They have that? She said, yes, right here in Baltimore. Unbeknownst to me, I was passing one every day. Right. Didn't know it. She told me to go to Wright's Law website. She said, uh, set a timer for 10 minutes. The website's very overwhelming. She said, if you can figure out how to sign up for the newsletter, go ahead and sign up for the newsletter. But I want you off of that site in 10 minutes. Don't spend more than 10 minutes on the site. It's very overwhelming. And she said, I want you to do lunch and learns and go understand special education law, right? Everything she told me to do. I didn't question it, Lederick. I just started doing it. I, I yeah. grabbed a book, Baltimore Child's book. It's a paper magazine. It had just whatever timing, whatever month it was, it had a list of, it had like a special education edition, right? And I saw a list of schools. I started looking them up, going to their websites. They had these parent visitation days where you can go learn about the school. And then I went to a lunch and learn, mm. uh, the Maryland Disability Rights. They had a lunch and learn. It was a Tuesday. I'll never forget. Put it on my calendar. That, that, that was my lunch break. I went to that session. They talked about the special education process, the IEP, and a lady there, Lon, Lon says to me, you ask such great questions, Winifred. Have you ever heard of decoding dyslexia? I'm like, no, what's that? She said, oh, it's an advocacy group of parents. I mean, you just ask such great questions. I think you would be great with them. I didn't know who they were, but it had the name dyslexia in it. Right. Right. And so I left that event and I was at a stoplight. I was driving and I was like, oh my gosh, what is that place she told me? And I look in my rear view mirror and Lon is behind me. I get out in Towson at the stoplight. I'm like, Lon, it's me. It's me. What's that organization you told me about? And then I connected with Decode and Dyslexia Maryland. And, and from there, I will say it was life-changing for our family. Before you go into decoding dyslexia, and then, you know, I am struck, it's resonating with me that uh, I believe you said it was the psychologist, the, the family doctor, but gave you this sort of like, almost like a program, right? It's like lunch and learn, here's the website, this, that, and the other. Mm -hmm. And everything that you were told, you just did, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember being, going through a, like an emotional breakdown as a teenager, getting into college, being a part of this disability support program for students with, with learning differences. And just basically whatever they said to do, I did it. 
right? Where do you think that that came from? Because I know that there are a lot of people that are just trying to make their own way and, you know, you know, I can figure it out. It's my kid, this, that, and the other. But, you know, I'm just struck by the the level of commitment and diving in to this advice that was given to you. Well, so I trusted the people mm-hmm. that I confided in, right? So my cousin, she's an attorney and she did some special education law in college, she, she went to Fordham and she said to me, well, I kind of figured there might've been like a LD, something going on with Logan. I'm like, why didn't you tell me? And she was like, well, I tried to, you know, I tried to slip some things in, but I wasn't hearing that. Right. And her first pediatrician, I trusted him. And then the, Dr. Betty, Dr. BB, um, a Wapa, I hope I'm saying that right. We call her Dr. Betty with GBMC PD, pediatrics. Yes. I'm, I'm saying the full name and contact. Yep. I trust Dr. Betty. Like I trust her and I was reading, I think I might've done a, a Google search on understood, understood.org. One of, it was one of my go-to places. And it said who to contact to get a diagnosis, like how to get a diagnosis. And it said, ask your pediatrician, you know, and I trusted her pediatrician. So I trusted my cousin when she told me Linda Mubell, I trusted the pediatrician. And, and at this point, I needed someone who knew how to get help. And so when my my pediatrician recommended that I call Janice, I didn't know Janice from a can of paint, but I trusted my pediatrician. And Janice, again, she was calm. Like what I was saying wasn't new. Like, but when I talked to like friends who didn't know, it was like, oh, there's nothing wrong with Logan. She's so smart. You're being over the top. You're a new mom. That was noise. Nah, something's going on here. And and now this report says that she has this specific learning disability. And so now I'm going to people who I felt like it wasn't, they did the, the first response wasn't, oh, Logan's smart. She'll be fine. It was, okay, this is what you need to do. And they were very calm. And it was like, oh, okay. So we're not the first ones, right? Or Or this isn't something that they never heard of. And when Janice told me to do those things, and as I did them, I learned, oh shit, there's like three, four, five, there's private dyslexia schools, right? Right. And then when I went to Rights Lord, that website as a first time overwhelmed, not knowing nothing, mom, it is very overwhelming. Yeah. Right. And so I did what she said. I got off, right. I signed up for the newsletter. I started to read the newsletter, right? Oh, this applies. This is applicable. I understand it. I went to the lunch and learn and it was a whole free session on the IEP process. So the guidance that they were giving me made sense. And these were things that I would have never thought of or, or have known to do without their guidance. And I felt like I need help. I need information. And where am I going to get it from? And so when I connected with the pediatrician, then Janice, and then go into that lunch and learn, and then connecting with decode and dyslexia, right? That was all life-changing because now I was surrounded with parents who knew about dyslexia and who knew how to get help. It was me knowing that this was a space that I knew nothing about. But yeah. having, having the trust in the people yes. who were, who are advising you. And yes. I, I think that's, I think that's powerful to hear too, right? Because, you know, if there's someone in, on here who's listening and wanting to give advice to somebody else, you could have great information, but if you haven't taken the time to build the trust and uh, a powerful connection and relationship with, mom or dad or whoever who, who might show up they may not heed that advice right yeah, and same. you know another thing is just how I was raised um, my mom worked she was a nurse she was a single mom she worked two jobs mm. and I was a latchkey kid my mom came to parent teacher conference but she wasn't involved I did well I was in advanced classes but I always say my mom we had presents p-r-e-s-e-n-t-s presents like gifts but she wasn't present right? Her presence wasn't there. And I always would think if my mom was engaged in my learning more, would I have done greater? Would I have done better? Like I went to visit a college, no lie. I got an athletic grant aid. Me, my boyfriend, and my best friend went to visit the college. We did the college tour, right? My coaches were instrumental in navigating and negotiating my scholarship. My mom loved me. My mom wanted me to go to college. She didn't let me take courses that allowed me to uh, go work in the factory because we were in North Carolina at the time. But I wanted to be more present for my daughter. So I wanted to to really be involved. Like that meant a lot to me, right? And 
I took the time to listen to webinars. I was going to sleep listening to YouTube videos. So now I have this child who I think the report didn't have to tell me because I'm like, okay, she's smart. Oh, but she learns differently. Let me figure this out. And I think that's something that a lot of parents have good intention and they really want to help their child, but it's just not their thing, right? Like I'm not the sleepover parent, right? right. But I've kind of done it with limited kids. But but before having Logan, none of my friends would say, oh, you're going to spend a summer with Auntie Wendy because I just wasn't that friend. Yeah. It just wasn't in me. I love them kids, but I don't know what to do with them. You know what I'm saying? So some parents, it's just not their thing. Right. Right. Like they try, they, they help with homework. But when I had Logan, I had to make it my thing because yeah. it meant a lot to me to give her what I didn't have. And you, it also sounds like you had the benefit of also as a vocation being in the education space, right? Like, you know, you'd had this professional experience of seeing struggling students and. Yeah, that was almost, that was a positive but I, I think about all the time, would I have done things a little differently? I had zero faith in the school system, in the public school system. Prior to being a teacher, I managed anywhere from 65 elementary middle schools here in the city. So I was able to see the inequity in the schools. When I was a teacher, I taught at one school. They told me I needed to have my lesson plan on the desk. I had no printer and no paper, right? I went to another school right here in the city. Oh, just go see um, secretary so-and-so. I had a printer. I had paper right? I'm like, what in the world? And then when I was managing those elementary middle schools, you know, I was on a network. So we had um, a literacy liaison to the school, a special education liaison to the school. I want to say a math and you had social work. And then I was HR. And I remember this uh, literacy person coming back from one of her learning walks at the school crying. And this woman was pregnant. And I don't know if she had other children, but she was crying, Lederick, because the kindergarten kids at this one elementary school had no gains. They weren't learning. I never forget it. Logan was about two, three at the time, but I never forgot that. You know what I mean? So I knew a lot of our elementary middle schools here in the city very intimately. I knew the leadership in the building. I knew things that other parents would not know about who is teaching their children, their credentials, the competency level of the leadership in the building, right? So. As soon as I felt like the school isn't being honest with me, I'm like, oh, no, we got to go. Right. Like, wait, 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 we got to go. And, and so that's why we didn't start off in a public school. Mm -hmm. So her dad was more like, well, let's see. I'm like, nope, mm -mm, mm -mm, nope. Like I've, 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 already, I've already seen, I've seen it. Yes, <laughs> yes. Right. So I was very quick to say, let's get out of here. But in hindsight, had we had an advocate, mm maybe we wouldn't be paying to send her. The school district would be paying. Uh, I think I said in one of the earlier podcasts, our school system is 90% African-American, but 90% of white, and I think it was Asian or either Indian kids get the non-public placement. And what that means is that the local school district is paying that tuition. Come on now, 90% of African-American children, and we're here in Baltimore and lead is a problem. Right. Yeah. And a lot of kids have multiple things going on. And you mean to tell me that 90 percent of the minority is getting the non-public placement. Right. Those parents have advocates, attorneys, access to information to to navigate this space in a way that the black parents in the city don't. Right. So I was just like I didn't take time to even once I did that last IEP meeting where we didn't even get to the goals. We didn't even get to go over the goals and we had a new psychologist and she was arguing with me about they're going to remove dyslexia off of the IEP. She told me it was a, a very general term. I, at this point now, I had a binder. I had books with me. So when she said that, I literally opened up the book and read out of the book where it said the school will tell you dyslexia is a generic term. And I was reading from the book and I'm looking around at everybody. Now she was new to the IEP team. So the other team members had their head down like, mm, like, come on, why is she playing with Winifred? And I'm telling her, we're not taking dyslexia off. We can agree to disagree. We can have dyslexia and your teacher talk mumbo jumbo. Right. At this point, I've called Wilson to confirm if the interventionist is certified, not just a certificate, because they have a record. They told me they're going to use Will. They didn't tell me they were going to use Wilson. I saw it in the report. 
And I called and they had no record of the person. I said, oh, so she, so in my mind, I'm like, she took the three-day certificate. Right. She's not even certified to, yeah. to provide the level of intervention that we need. I called MSDE, Maryland State Department of Education, because she said that we don't have a way to put dyslexia on the IEP. MSDE told me of the 27 school districts in Maryland, 20 of them use our IEP template, and there is a drop down for dyslexia, dyscalculia, and dysgraphia. And the other districts who don't use our template, whatever vendor that is providing their IEP template must have certain things in it that we have in ours. So when the psychologist told me that, my response was, well, I called MSDE yesterday. And, right. MSD, and so she is new to me. The rest of the team is like, this is not what we're here for today. Like we like, you know, and what happened was I wasn't getting the progress reports for her goals. So I felt like I didn't know where we were, where Logan was and how she was progressing. So the principal said, Winifred, you keep calling IEP meetings. Are we not communicating enough with you? I said, well, I mean, I think the communication is good, but I just don't know where she is. And she said, mm -hmm. well, are you reading the progress reports? I said, what progress reports? And so she started looking around, you know, so I said, uh oh, that was a red flag for me. Well, the IEP chair, I guess just an oversight made a mistake and I wasn't getting progress reports that align with the goals. Right. Now with all the training and education I've had, I have now, I know that was a big oopsie, a big one, yeah, a big one, but I didn't know that then. Mm -hmm. So when I saw, okay, there are private schools that, you know, are for kiddos with dyslexia, we go in that route. So my thing was just exit strategy. How do we just get out? I didn't want to fight the system. I didn't want to try to get the IEP robust. You know, I was done. Yeah, I was done. And if, and if you, uh, you can bring us back, you were, you were saying how, you know, you eventually had heard about the coding dyslexia. Can you give us the trajectory from, uh, DD to, uh, to bad? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. So I said Janice's name because that's really, um, it's really profound. So I started going to decode and dyslexia support group meetings that were hosted at a private dyslexia school. And that's, was that what they were called, support group meetings? Well, <laughs> well, I call them that yeah. because each chapter is going to have a different flavor. Mm. And our we didn't have a chapter in Baltimore City. The chapter I attended was Baltimore County, which is right next door to Baltimore City. So our chapter had a lot of folks who had policy and legislative experience. So we really focused and we had state leaders the two state leaders, the main two state leaders, one of them was in Baltimore County. So Baltimore County had a very policy advocacy flavor, right? But you had parents and professionals who are part of this. They were support groups because you could go there and ask questions. You can get information, but it was very overwhelming because there's a lot of legislation and we got this House bill, this Senate bill, you know, I'm just taking notes and I'm looking around for other black folks, right? Because I don't see none. And I'm thinking, okay. I need a support group in Baltimore city because they're not going to drive all the way out here to the County. Right. And we need one in the city. And I'm thinking this in early 2018 and I'm going to advocacy day in Annapolis. And a year later I call, I say to myself, I want to get a chapter in Baltimore city. And I was just going to have more of a parent flavor. We're going to give parents information, right? Because I don't know policy and legislation like that. Right. But I'm going to have a more of a support flavor to give them information. I said, well, I need to get speakers. Right. I said, well, let me get some speakers. And I was pumped up because the night before I had just been to a decode and dyslexia meeting and I left there thinking I'm going to start one in the city. I'm just pumped. I'm going to start one in the city. So I said, what is that lady's name that my pediatrician had me call? Right. And I remembered Lapore. And I'm like, okay, okay, okay. Let me Google, Google, Google. I was like, oh, Janice Lapore, let me call her. So I call her up and I say, hi, you know, my name is Winifred. I spoke with you about a year ago because at this point it had been a year. And she says, hi, Winifred. I said, hello. <laughs> and she's like, yeah, what's going on? Oh, okay, okay. Well, I talked to you about a year ago and you really helped me, right? You told me to do all these things and, and I did it and I'm, I'm starting a support group I think I even told her I already have the support group started because I'm asking her to come speak. So I want her to think I have people lined up to listen. So it's right? already done, right? Yes, yes, yes. So I'm, 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 you know, I'm giving it the flavor. We have a support group. You know, we get about 
15 to 20 parents. <laughs> <laughs> we would love for you to come speak. And she's like, Winifred, like she keeps saying my name, like she know me. Like, yeah, we, yeah, we, right. So, so, so I'm playing, so I'm being brand new, right? Yes, yes. So then she's like, Winifred, it's me, Janice. And I say to my, me, Janice. <gasps> I said, Janice from last night? And she's like, yes. I'm like, holy shit. We were sitting beside each other mm. at a at the Decode and Dyslexia meeting. And I was so pumped that night. I was wow. taking notes. I was drawing the table and I was putting everybody's name. I didn't put Lepore. I just put Janice, psychologist, Nicole, attorney, right? And, and I'm trying to piece together who people are in this space. Because now I'm realizing that some of these are parents, but they're also professionals in the space. Like Nicole Joseph is a special education attorney. Right. Mm -hmm. Janice Lepore is the psychologist that talked me off the ledge and get this. She didn't even really remember me. She was like, you know how many parents I talk to all the time. <laughs> so that was very like, oh, my gosh. Now I'm thinking, Lederick, these people are my friends. Mm -hmm. Right. Because Janice was like, sure, whenever, whatever you need. Yeah, I'll do. But I was just sitting next to her the night before. We were literally sitting side by side at the, the support group table. But I didn't yeah. know it was the same woman that had helped me a year ago. Right. So, so I love telling that story because I didn't know. I, I just didn't realize it. So in doing the work with Decode and Dyslexia, uh, Laura and Carlene, I, I still consider them mentors. They tricked me into being a state leader. <laughs> right. They were very good at figuring out what you were good at and what you're interested in. And then you just have to ask a question and they'll say, oh, you're leading that up. And then you feel obligated to say, yes, I will do that, I think. <laughs> And so I enlisted the help of two other parents, Ginger and Camilla, who we had on, who, who opened our session with the Badass Parent segment, and Khadija, a former educator, to help me start the Decode and Dyslexia Baltimore City chapter. So we started a chapter here in the city. But at this point now, I'm learning more and I feel like I need to help parents more. Like, what can I do? How can I help them with the cost? right? Because it's expensive. Yes. Right. And the emotional turmoil that you go through as a parent trying to navigate this space. I was working at um, Johns Hopkins at the time, and I was working a Hopkins local initiative. One of my former students wanted to get a job. She texted me because we still kept in touch, but I knew she had a learning disability and I knew she would not be successful on the 100 question assessment. And now I'm just every day I'm thinking about how can I help other people? How, how are we going to get my daughter into the private dyslexia schools, which are very expensive in a tune of 30,000 up. We had a health scare in the family and I fainted at work. And when I came to, I could not move my left side. I could not speak. And they, when the ambulance came, they started yelling stroke, stroke. I couldn't speak. And my mother succumbed to a stroke. And here I'm thinking, I'm in my mid 40s. Logan is eight. I can't have a stroke. Right. And my neurologist said, You were internalizing the stress. And parents are stressed the hell out during this process. Yeah. Right. So I'm like, How can I help? And what is causing me the most stress? What's causing me the most stress is $150 to pay somebody weekly to pick her up and take her the $123 an hour for 10 hours a week, uh, the $30,000 tuition tag, how are we going to get her in a private school? Like I was stressed out, but it wasn't really showing because I was internalizing all of this. Yeah. The, st the stress has to go somewhere. You, exactly. And it, it, it will show up in the body. Yeah. And when I had the, the, when I fainted, I fainted and then I had a concussion and I used that time off from work. What can you do differently? What more information do you need? Like what change do you need to make? Because I have to make a change because now it's impacting my health. Right. And so I changed careers and I started working for one of the private dyslexia schools as director of admissions. And I did it for a year and it helped me really understand the connections, right? It helped me understand the, the inequity. It helped me understand more about racism, I didn't want to believe, you know, that my little eight year old, I, I didn't want to believe she was experiencing some of what she was experiencing. And 
I thought, what can I do? And so I thought about making it a for-profit, right? But I wanted to help parents pay because the money thing is what was really hindering a lot of parents. And that was causing me the most stress and nobody else was offering money. When I tell you, I called, I emailed legislators, politicians. I was on IDA website. I was looking for money. And the only thing, um, one thing that Trump did was he allowed you to pull money from your 529, I believe it is, right? To pay for private school before you couldn't do that in K-12. Like I was looking for funding scholarships. There was no scholarship. Everything was low income, right? Uh, we weren't low income. We were in the right. middle. We weren't right. low income. We weren't wealthy. And I'm like, how can I help parents? So then I just started building up my Instagram. I just started being more visual on uh, social media. I put together a little freemium on the three steps to win over dyslexia. What do parents need to know? How, how do they need to start this process? And then I said, okay, I ran a business before and I was a solopreneur. I didn't want to do that again. I needed help. I wanted um, community. I wanted, I knew I couldn't do it alone. And so I said, oh, I'm going to do a nonprofit. I'm going to start a nonprofit and we're, I'm going to get a board and I'm going to get other people to partner with me. I've been in this space for a while and I'm going to help parents yeah. pay for these things. And, and that's how Dyslexia Advocation came to be. And the podcast was, I was doing these features on Instagram, Black and Dyslexic, hashtag Black and Dyslexic. And I thought they were successful. And I was combing the internet, trying to find Black folks who were successful celebrities who were dyslexic. And that was very limited. Whoopi Goldberg, Danny Glover, Kobe Bryant, the same ones came up. And then I started featuring every day. I called them everyday dyslexics because I started meeting dyslexics everywhere. Right. Yeah. The firefighter, my, my good friend, husband's dyslexic. I'm like, how come you ain't tell me, you know, I've been going through this with my daughter, the man at the barbershop. I just start interviewing regular folk because I'm like, everybody can't identify with a celebrity and Claire Reese, you know, a friend of ours in the community. Yeah. We were having a talk about me changing the name. And she was like, don't you do that? You know, you make it a program, make it a podcast, have the people come on and, and talk about it themselves. And I was like, aha, a podcast. Yes, I think so. And so I set out to get some grants and some funding to help launch. And again, I'm in the mix and I'm doing all of this. And one of my board members, she's like, you can't do everything yourself, Winifred. LaDerek's on the committee. He has an interest. Ask him to co-host with you. I'm like, you're right. You're on to something. And that's how the Black and Dyslexic podcast came to be. That's it. Yeah. I remember when you were first telling me about dyslexia avocation, I think what I said was just, I'm, I'm a resource. So just let me know, you know, and I can, I can talk, <laughs> right. I can do a presentation. I can do that sort of thing. And I don't, I don't even know if podcast had, had come to mind, but no, uh, it literally was yeah. out of the conversation with Clarice, literally, right. like she was like, you could do a podcast. It'll be a program, dyslexia awareness. And, you know, and I was like, Hmm. At this point, I had been a guest on several podcasts and I totally loved being a guest, yeah. right? So much so that I would never listen to them. I would never listen to my episode because I didn't want to hear myself, <laughs> right? And I'm like, I started thinking about how many more people I could reach. I started mm -hmm. thinking about the people we could have on the podcast because at this point I had done, I went to the International Dyslexia Association conference where I met you in Portland right. and I saw all these people, right? All these people giving presentations and I'm like, where are the parents, right? Parents need to be here getting this information. And I'm thinking I could interview those people on the podcast, right? And I think the real push for me to even have the title Black and Dyslexic was a result of the uprising with um, the murder of George Floyd and those before him because Trayvon Martin really stuck in my head. I have a ton of nephews, but I had two nephews live here with me for a short time in Baltimore. And when I tell you they were 19 and 21 at the time, or maybe 18 and 20 at the time, and they had tattoos. They had like long hair, hadn't dreaded up yet, but I made them get haircuts. They had fades. When they left my house, they had on khakis and a polo shirt mm -hmm. and a belt. I was scared. I was scared like every time they left the house and I um, made friends with the lady who was the receptionist at the school. So I called every morning to make sure that they made it. And I told her she better not tell. She was a young girl, met her at the barbershop. And I was scared. When Trayvon Martin happened, I was 
it hurt so bad because I kept thinking that could have been one of my nephews, right? Yeah. And, and I was giving them my car because we built up the trust and one of them had license so they could kind of go out on their own, you know, without me. And then Sandra Bland, that one hurt my heart because I kind of saw myself as a Sandra, you know, my mouth, you know, sometimes I say things before speaking and, and people might be like, oh, you always have to be so kind. And, you know, I've been pulled over by the cops. I remember one time I was doing a non-paid internship, a woman sideswiped me and tried to run. I followed her and I'm blowing the horn, blowing the horn. So she eventually pulled over. Oh shit, it ain't damaged that bad. White older lady called the cops. Cops came, white cop. Oh, officer, she followed me and no, uh, there's no damage and she hit me. And I'm like, she's lying. And he's like, uh, you need to watch your tone for I take you in. I was livid. And she had this smirk on her face. I will never forget it. I was so mad. And I'm like, I could have been Sandra, right? Like I remember coming from the hospital in Moore County in North Carolina in uh, Pinehurst area. Michael Jordan had a house there yeah. or, or played golf there, you know? And I got pulled over by the police. It was a downhill. And of, I mean, the speed limit might've been 35 and I might've been going 40, 45. Cause it, I mean, literally right when you got to the bottom of the hill, the speed limit changed. It was like right. a speed trap. I got pulled over and my sister was in the car. She's older than me. <sighs> I don't know why I didn't get arrested. I'm gonna be honest. I was livid. I told him, man, I can't even repeat what I said to that man. But Sandra Bland, that really, that hurt that those two really hurt, right? Yeah. And so then when George Floyd happened and the unrest happened and I had been uh, gotten my feelings hurt in this space, I was very intentional about helping my people. And I was going to be unapologetic about it. And I didn't give a shit about making white people feel comfortable. Yeah. And I got a lot of pushback from, from black folks in the space, right? well, you want to help all people. I said, I do. And I help all people. And I'm not saying I'm not going to help anybody else, but I'm going to make sure I help people that look like me because my daughter was, you know, I had the experience. We were the only black family at a school. And I remember telling my daughter, well, there's another black girl. My daughter at eight said to me, no, mommy, her parents are white and they treat her different. Right. And my daughter, she didn't know about racism. Right. But she knew she was being treated differently. She knew she didn't feel comfortable because of the color of her skin. And that made me feel like I needed to do more. It made me feel and check myself because I went to a PWI for undergrad, first two jobs out of college. I was the only black person in my position, in my role. I had been called a banana girl. I had been referred to as a colored girl. And I felt like I got complacent as being the only black person in a white space all the time, you are not the voice for all black people. Of course not. And, and, and they will say that you are and make you feel that way. And when Katrina happened, I had a, a little disagreement with some of my young white coworkers, right? Because I wanted to give up my spare bedroom to somebody in need. Hmm. Because I'm like, I have an apartment here. I got an extra bedroom. Somebody needs a place. You know, and they were saying things like, oh, they should have had their bank in another, uh, had their money in another bank. Oh, they should have planned for this. You don't plan for a, a catastrophe like that. And um, they said, well, Winifred, don't talk about Katrina and those poor people. She gets angry. And since that experience, I kind of started like suppressing my voice. I wouldn't speak up when I would hear certain things. I wouldn't say like that's inappropriate. I wouldn't check people. I yeah. just kind of put my, I just, you know, put my head down, just kept working. And then I became, um, I worked for another organization where I was the only black person in my job. And this one really resonated with me because we made a lot of money first year, no experience, white kids, no experience, just a bachelor's degree. We're making 80,000. Okay. 80,000. And in my market, we probably were making 70, but I had four years experience. I had a bachelor's, like I was more experienced than any of them. And when I went to King of Pressure, I saw all the black kids that had bachelor's downstairs and customer service on the phone, mm. right? They weren't my role as client care specialist. I was the face of the organization. Basically after the sales rep sold it, I managed the accounts, the business accounts. I kept the customers happy. My bonus came from retention, fixing their problems, building relationships. That was my job. And that's when I saw the, the money thing, the inequity there, as far as opportunities for black 
college graduates versus white college graduates and how a lot of the black college graduates would say, oh, I need experience. I have to build up this. Whereas the white kids would just apply. Yeah. Right. And, and I say all that to say that it got really personal and emotional for me because I felt like I missed some opportunities to really be a voice. And I didn't want that to ever happen again. And I could completely relate. And I think it's part of the reason why I, I signed on. You know, I think that I had spent so much of my career talking about the, the common experience that people from different demographic groups had of experiencing dyslexia. Um, and how it could be this great unifier. But I think that Ahmaud Aubrey and George Floyd and, and then the pause that the pandemic allowed, right? The pause and the opportunity for reflection made me want to say, yeah, that there is this, this beautiful common experience that all people with dyslexia can have that cuts across all these different kinds of economic levels and race and what have you. But... <laughs> There are also some differences which are blaring, right? When you really start to look at them and no one's really talking about that. No one's filling that space with empowerment. And so, yeah, this journey that we've been on has been very rewarding. And I appreciate you pulling all that ADHD energy <laughs> into getting this thing done, right? Yes, um, yes. And it's, it's, been a, it's been a fun ride. I, I, wanna, I wanna close this out. So this is, uh, this is gonna be released when we're in the midst of the holiday season. And I'm just, I'm curious as to like for you and Logan, you know, like what's, what's the holiday season look like for y'all? Like, is this, you still going hard with the tutoring and the support or does your baby well, get to take a breath or, or what? Well, she still has to, although we're at a private dyslexia school, we still do tutoring. When the pandemic started, I was so afraid she would get behind. And I found a tutor who we could afford and who, Oh my gosh. I feel like she's a part of the family. I listen to Logan sometime when they start the session, Logan, like talking to her, I'm like, she ain't tell me that. And you know, I'll text her and be like, she ain't tell me that, but she's telling Christina. And so we keep her two times a week and I didn't want to let her go because with the pandemic, you just didn't know she was virtual school and she was in person. So she still does tutoring. She, she will get a break probably like a week in the holiday, but mm -hmm. we still keep the tutoring two times a week. She's in sixth grade. She just got her first report card. She got all A's and A minus. And I just heard her crying the other day to her dad because her grade in math went from a 99 to a 94. Mm, that's rough. That's rough. I mean, you know, come like, on. Yeah. Struggle, like that struggles, 90, struggles real. The 94, <laughs> you know, so she's doing well in school and she, her reading has, has come a long way. It has come a long way and she doesn't really want to do the tutoring anymore because she's like, I have tutoring every day at school, mommy, I'm reading now, but I'm like, mm, no, I'm still trying to get to, uh, we're using the Barton reading and spelling system and they have 10 steps and I'll be damned. We're going to make it to step 10. Like, I don't, you know, um, but the holiday, she'll get a, like a, a week break. But what I've done is. I've allowed her to do other things, right? So she's taken sewing lessons. Oh, um, so we sneak in, I think I talked about it briefly. We sneak in the reading, the measurements, the math, and it helps with the dysgraphia, right? The hand coordination. She just made her first leather purse. She hand sewed that and she made some pants and she's doing that. And we did cooking lessons. She loves cooking. We did cooking class with Black Girls Cook. Mm. That plug out there, Black Girls Cook. It's a nonprofit here in Baltimore. She won the first time she did it. She won best presentation. So she, oh my gosh, she just made something the other night. And she was like, here, mommy, the presentation was amazing, but I didn't, I didn't tell her that. Um, and um, I, she wants to do horseback riding again. So I try to find other things that she's interested in and move things around so that she can do those things, but still have the tutoring and to try to find that balance because she is a sixth grader who's very articulate about what she wants and what she wants to do. And, you know, I'm like, but you're still doing tutoring. So the holidays will be more of a break for me to try yeah. to like reassess and figure out what we're going to do and what I'm going to do for 2022. Hmm. Right. So I feel like finally I can kind of breathe and I don't have to be all over her because yeah. the school is doing a good job. I see where she is doing awesome in school. I see where she is thriving. And, and finally, right, we're talking about from kindergarten to now sixth grade, 
I'm feeling like I can kind of like who saw like I think I even said that who saw I'm sorry who saw who saw like <laughs> but you know I want parents to know it is a marathon it is not a sprint yeah you know it is a marathon it is not a sprint and when I talk to parents I feel their energy I know how anxious they are for their baby to learn to read and they want help now because that's exactly how I felt. Once we did one session, could I tell anything, right? Two weeks, okay, is she reading, right? But it's a marathon and tutoring isn't like summer tutoring. I need parents to understand you need to do a year long, two years, like you need to do three years, like you need to keep this going. So that's why we wanna be able to help parents offset the cost for 10 months right? We want to help them because I don't want you in tutoring for just three months, right? I want that baby in tutoring for 12 months, for 24 months. I want you to keep going so we can close that gap. And and they really need that. So the holidays, we take a little break and I'm gonna be honest because the tutor says she's off. So then I'm like, okay. (laughs) Yeah. But if if the tutor was working, (laughs) Logan's working, right? (laughs) Two days a week. I'm just like two days a week. (laughs) You just sort of gave us some good advice there, but I'll just ask because it's the tradition for our, how we close out our episodes. You have one piece of advice for the audience, for the families who are listening. I would say, and I say this quote all the time, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take, right? And the first thing a lot of parents tell me is I don't have the money. I did not have the money. I don't have the money. I lost my job during the pandemic. I went seven or nine, nine months actually with no income because I was one of the millions of folks here in Maryland who unemployment got hung up. I was still able to find a tutor find a tutor that we could afford. I was still able to get her what she needed, right? That is fear, right? That is fear. And and I want parents to know that you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. When we apply to the private school, I'm like, okay, we got to apply, right? Pay the application fee. All right, let's apply. We got to get in. Let's get in. Now I'm paying attention to this documentation because you signed a contract. So I was like, shit, we about to sign this contract. Well, what are the options to pay, right? And you could split the tuition, 65 and 35 or something like that. I'm like, okay, how are we gonna come up with the 65, right? I'm like, okay, can I take a part-time job? Can I change this tax exemption? Like I literally was doing it like this. Now her father on the other hand was like, we cannot afford it. I'm like, look, you know, we are gonna keep going until I get to a complete and absolute stop, right? And We figured it out. And if there was a dyslexia advocation, right? If there was a place that I could go to that says, you know what, we have a stipend, we have some funding, we can help you and and we can get you connected with other resources. My advice to parents is you miss 100% of the shots you don't take, right? And please, please do not let the money, the fear stop you from getting the help that your child needs because there are resources and there are people who will help you? All right. I don't have the uh, Winifred close of episode script in front of me, but I, I know it It ends something like, and there we have it. Another <laughs> another amazing episode. Please join us next week for more empowering conversations. <laughs> cut all of this out. No, don't cut it out. No, it closes something like that. But more than anything, I want to say, Winifred, thank you for being uh, one of the real lights in this space for so many of us. Thank you for sharing your journey and your daughter's journey on this path. And thank you for uh, making the way easier for so many. And I just hope that everyone has appreciated this episode, the episodes that have already been released and those yet to come. And uh, I hope you all have a wonderful holiday season. Absolutely. It's a wrap. Tune in next week where we'll continue to bring you lived experiences and more unfiltered conversations with experts in the field around all things Black and dyslexic. Make sure you subscribe and follow the Black and Dyslexic podcast, where we educate, empower, and equip Black and underrepresented minorities. The Black and Dyslexic podcast is partially funded by Morgan Cares and the Center for Urban Health Disparities Research and Innovation, 
awarded by the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. The Black and Dyslexic Podcast is sponsored by Dyslexia Advocation Incorporated, a 501c3 charitable organization located in Baltimore City, Maryland, whose mission is to equip parents of children with dyslexia and other language-based learning disabilities with the necessary tools to help their children become successful readers. You can find them on the web at www.soallcanread.org.